The Seventh Cardinal Louis Santonio Tartle was ordained to the priesthood in 1982. He did his uh, doctorate studies in sacred theology at the Catholic University of America. In 1997, he was appointed member of the International Theological Commission of the Vatican. In 1998, he was an expert at the Special Assembly of the Synod of Bishops for Asia. He was appointed Bishop of Imus, that is in the Philippines, in 2001. Later, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him as the 32nd Archbishop of Manila in 2011, and later named him to the College of Cardinals. He participated the 13th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization in 2012. Now he is a member of the Presidential Committee of the Pontifical Council for the Family and also the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant. So he has had a long uh, uh, birthday, but then we know very well he is a well known speaker, not only in Asia, but also in other parts of the world. He also was a main speaker for our association last year. Now he will talk on Missio Intergentis and New Evangelization. As usual, we will talk around 25 minutes, then we will have a your eminence, part of my are happy to have you, and we welcome you warmly to this particular conversation. Thank you very much, Father. I thank you for not reading all that. Uh, is contained in the curriculum detail. <laughs> good morning to everyone. Good morning. It's good to be here. And uh, this is my first time to Africa. And, uh, and so for me, the door to Africa is Kenya, Nairobi, thanks to the uh, International Association of Catholic Missionologists. You open the door for me to enter this great continent. You know, I really am uh, at a loss. What am I doing in a meeting of international missionologists? Because I am not a trained missionologist. I do not know what I am good at or are trained for. <laughs> but. Uh, here I am. I am taking this uh, this invitation with uh, with open heart and uh, open heart and an open mind, uh, in the hope and faith that I might be able to share something of value to your discussion. Uh, before coming here, I spent two days in Kerala, in India. Uh, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the death of Archbishop Mar Ibanez, who uh, facilitated the uh, union of the Siro Malankara Church with the Church of Rome. Yeah. So uh, I think we have people from India here. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, was a, it was also a great experience uh, and for me, an eye-opener, you know, uh, about uh, what, uh, what communion is all about, uh, even within the Catholic Church, the richness of the rites, the richness of, uh, the riches of, uh, of, our, of our liturgy and the experience of God, and also mission. Now, let me go to my uh, uh, presentation. I'm sorry I don't have a PowerPoint, you know, in one conference that I attended, 
I was the only speaker without a PowerPoint presentation. And the organizer really chided me, uh, reprimanded me. And he says, he told me, uh, nowadays, without a PowerPoint presentation, a presentation has neither power nor point. <laughs> but I said, well, don't call me anymore. <laughs> but really, I don't have time. I have no time to write out a whole conference. I don't have time to uh, prepare a PowerPoint presentation. So I think I, I have what I have. My voice, you know, my face. So when all of these technological things collapse, something remains. You have a voice, you have a face, so you can share. Hi, <laughs> Father David. Isn't Father David? What are you doing here? <laughs> I heard you were here. Uh, you're here now in Kenya? I'm teaching it. Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> Okay, so my, my, my uh, topic, uh, at least the topic assigned to me, uh, is Missio Intergentes and uh, New Evangelization. Uh, preparing my presentation, I thought of two objectives for myself, and I hope these objectives will ser serve you well too. My first objective is to show how Missio Intergentis, uh, as presented primarily by Professor uh, Jonathan Tan. Is he still here? Uh, hi. hi. Good to see you again. Oh, yeah. You look well. So I want to show how Missio Intergentis, primarily as presented uh, by Professor Tan, can contribute positively to the ongoing discussion on new evangelization. I am a member of the Council of the Synod of Bishops. So we are helping Pope Francis finalize the post-Synod Apostolic Exhortation on the new evangelization for the transmission of the faith. And uh, we will have a meeting again uh, in October and I would want to share with them uh, the Missio Intergentes as a possible way of uh, looking at uh, the new evangelization. And so that is one objective. The other objective that I impose on myself is to show also how some directions coming especially from the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization last October 2012, can enrich and even evaluate Missio Intergentis. So I would like to uh, bring Missio Intergentis and new evangelization into some sort of a dialogue. What one can contribute to the other and how one can purify the other too. Purify and enrich the other. Now, Missio Intergentis, that portion has been settled by Professor, Professor Pan, so that's not my problem anymore. <laughs> New evangelization is my big problem. How will I present it to you? Now, I have to make a choice, and I had opted to dwell on the message of the sin of the bishops to the people of God, where, from where the prayer uh, that we had was taken. I thought that was the, uh, the immediate fruit of the sin of the bishops. And for many people, uh, the post synod apostolic exhortation comes quite, quite late. No. And so more official than the message of the synod to the people of God, still because of the distance in time,
people remember the Synod mainly through the message. And so I would like to dwell on the message of the Synod and make it the reference point of my, uh, my presentation. And I think it is very Asian too because the message of the Synod of Bishops of the New Evangelization uses John 4, 1 to 42, the story of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. So this pre provided a narrative, a narrative matrix to understand the new evangelization and to understand uh, the key ideas that emerged in the Synod. Well, of course, the message does not exhaust all the ideas and insights regarding new evangelization that emerged in the Synod. But for our purposes, you know, I think, and uh, I, coming from Asia, where we had the Asian Mission Congress focused on telling the story of Jesus, I guess instead of a conceptual analytic approach, let us go back to narrative. Let us go back to a story. And let it convey to us uh, the insights of uh, the assembly on uh, the new evangelization and also become also a narrative of Missio Intergentis, looking at Jesus. Do I have to read the whole text or do we all know the story? I think we can presuppose that uh, we know the story of uh, Jesus' encounter with the woman uh, of Samaria. Do we? Yes. Yes. I have to ask that because in one oral examination, a student said something and I asked the student whether it is founded on the Bible and he said yes. I said, where in the Bible? I think it's in one of the Gospels. <laughs> Which Gospel? He said, Matthew. Where in Matthew? He said, I think in the 32nd chapter. <laughs> the 32nd chapter. <laughs> what Bible are you using? Because <laughs> my Bible has only 28 chapters in Matthew. And you have 32 chapters. <laughs> but this is a group of holy men and women. <laughs> and committed to mission of the church. So I think we can presuppose that. But before going to the points which uh, follow the story very uh, closely, one message from the Synod is this. We have to learn from Jesus how to be an evangelizer. In the Synod Hall, especially in the small group discussions, when, the, when the, the focus shifted from strategies, from uh, uh, techniques, you know, I was surprised that there was a convergence. Let us learn from Jesus again. He is for us the model of mission, the model of evangelization. So can we turn to him and learn from him? And so it is from that optic that we will review this message of the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization. And at certain points, I will draw also some connections with Mission Intergenesis. So the first, the first point of the story and of the message. Jesus, in chapter 4, 1 to 6, is described as weary with his journey. Jesus was on a journey with his disciples, and he felt tired and weary. Bearing this weariness and tiredness, he sat at Jacob's fountain, at Jacob's well, at the sixth hour. 
This is how the story begins. And let us highlight a few points. Yes, uh, if you don't read some of these points, this is how the story begins. And let us highlight a few points. Yes, uh, if you don't read some of these points, in the message, if you want, if you're tempted to read the message of the Synod of Bishops, please do not resist. Yield to the temptation. This is one temptation that we should not resist. But I was part of the group, the committee that formulated it. So some of the things here that I will share uh, cannot be found in the message, but are found in the deliberations. Now, so this first part. Let us look at Jesus, the missionary par excellence, the one sent by God. And he's depicted in this passage as an ordinary traveler, just like any other traveler. The missioner as a traveler. And just like other travelers, he gets tired. He experiences weariness. And this is not just a common experience of travelers. It is a common experience of so many brothers and sisters who journey through life. Especially the poor. What a journey. And Jesus, the missionary, is one of them. And he sits at this well. He is at the well before the Samaritan woman gets there. He was already there before the woman Yes, to the well. It's as though Jesus is waiting for them. It's as though Jesus, tired and thirsty, is waiting for this special person from Samaria. An ordinary well, an ordinary time will be the place and the time for an extraordinary meeting. Now in the context of initial intergenerous and the new evangelization, this image of Jesus as traveler, weary and thirsty, presents for us a powerful image of a mission or even of a church, a community with a mission. A far cry from the image of a triumphant conqueror. <coughs> a far cry from the image of someone whose journey is that of conquest, coming from a position of strength. Here you have the one sent by God as a fellow journeyer, as someone who understands the tiredness, the weariness of humanity. And this, in a way, puts to question some images or models of mission where the missioner should come to a place you know, bearing all the light, bearing all what is good. As though you have no, no reason to go on mission, to be sent, 
if you are as tired and as confused as the people that you will encounter. So even in, uh, even in uh, I guess, in dioceses and religious orders, you don't just send to mission, uh, again, this might be, it agentes, no? but uh, it, it, it doesn't disappear with interagentes. No? You send people on mission, I'm sure you do not send those who are confused and tired. <laughs> you will say, oh, what will, what will this person do? No? That's the last person that you will send on mission. In fact, that person, you will probably send to a quarantine center. <laughs> and you say, that person should not communicate with anyone. So, what are our criteria? Here, Jesus is sent, and the one who is sent is a journeyer who can, at many points of his journey, become tired, thirsty, fearful, just like the rest. <coughs> now the synod also has one reflection on this aspect. The synod invites us to identify the wells where our people go to especially the youth, the migrants, the refugees, the tired and weary of our time. What are the wells offered by the world? And the question of the sinner in the new evangelization is, does the church sit beside those wells? the way Jesus sat at the well of Samaria in Sikkim? Or are we sitting at fountains and pools that are not frequented by the tired and weary of our time? This is an important question presented by the new evangelization. And I think it is a question that Bishop Intergentis also raises. How sad it will be when the tired and weary go to somewhere else and those who are supposed to meet them in a dialogical mission are seated or even immersed in different worlds. The Synod also calls on us to help people discern in the new evangelization whether the water they draw from the wells they frequent give them clean, fresh water or polluted water. So part of the new evangelization is not only to be with people at their wells, to share their wells, but also together discern whether the water given to us by these wells is really refreshing or is it poisonous water. Well, you did that. So in this regard, I think the initial reflections of the sinner on the new evangelization, I think, resonate well with uh, some of the views, the ideas regarding vision, <laughs> intelligence. And this is just the beginning of the story. We can even add here. It already says a lot. It already says a lot. Now, reflecting on this a bit, you know, uh, I uh, used the, uh, the, the Philippine context. Now, what are the wells? The wells, you know, where our young people go to draw water. Shop. 
rewards of course. Internet cafes, the mobile phone. Are we there? Now I go to the second point. John 4, 5 to 6. The town of Sikar, where the story unfolds, is in Samaria. An enemy territory, in quotation marks, of course. Yet, Jesus does not only pass by Sikar, but sits and stays, according to the whole story. Now, a few points from this item, this uh, datum, uh, which I think is important for understanding Misio Inter Gentis and New Evangelization. From the description of Jesus as traveler in the first lines of this episode and from the outcome of the whole story, we know that Jesus comes to Sikar, to this Sumerian town, not in order to start a fight. That was not his goal. As the story unfolds, we realize that Jesus, the traveler, comes there and whether will, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, he engages the people in an encounter. He stays not in order to conquer. He stays not in order to call on fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy this enemy territory. He comes as a regular traveler and he finds this place good enough for fresh water. Imagine thinking that you can get fresh water in enemy territory. Instead of avoiding enemy territory for fear that you might get poisoned or killed there. But no full of trust, full of openness, full of hope. I know I am in a territory hostile to my people, but I dare stay. I dare sit here, and I will taste their water. Now, the Synod reminds us that while the world, contemporary society, in many ways presents itself as enemy to religion and specifically to the Christian vision, and we don't hide the problems and the contradictions present in our world, the Synod reminds us in the message that this world, perceived by many sectors as an enemy world, as the cause of the slackening of religion and of Christianity, and even the persecution of religious people, the Synod, inspired by this image of Jesus, says, this world in its Darkness and its woundedness remains as God's creation. It remains God's world. God has not left it. God is very much present in this world. Also gives us opportunities for communicating the power of the gospel and the reign of God. And the message of the Synod goes through a, a, a number of the so-called 
problems in the world that are also opportunities for evangelization. One is secularization. Now, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, secularization is one of uh, the many uh, the many enemies identified. <laughs> but according to the single message, yes, secularization poses a problem to us, but it also gives us as church an opportunity to discern what is a new way of being present to the world. The problem also opens a new opportunity a new way of being church in the world. Now, a, a, a theme very close to our hearts, migration. As uh, Father mentioned, I was uh, named uh, a member of the political <coughs> council for the uh, pastoral care of migrants and itinerant peoples. We just had our general assembly last uh, as June, and uh, the theme of the assembly focused on uh, forced migration. So this is not just uh, migration per se, but forced. People who out of poverty, out of political and ethnic unrest, are forced to leave their country, their homeland. <coughs> and according to one report, there are, at the moment, 27 million forced migrants in the world, deprived of rights, deprived of protection, because no state, some, some states uh, don't recognize them. And even for those who, uh, in a way, chose to migrate to another land, we see a lot of problems. The Philippines ranks four among migrant sending countries. So our best export export is about our Filipino people. Uh, yeah. And I see the effects, the wounds caused by migration. Now many children left in the Philippines have money to spend. Euros, dollars sent by their parents. So they are able to go to good schools, buy fashionable clothing. They're up, updated in terms of uh, gadgets and everything. They have money. But it is also observed by many educators that these children have some emotional and learning disabilities. And this is a lasting wound caused by migration. Yes, which wounded my heart. Cardinal Woodrow's ride of Lebanon approached me during the meeting and said, oh, thank you. Thank you for sending the Filipino migrants to Lebanon. Without the Filipinos, the church in Lebanon would be dead. So he says, thanks to migration, yes, there are wounds, but there is fresh life also in other parts of the world. And when he told me that, my fear, which was about to fall, <laughs> should I cry, should I smile, what? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of, of the new evangelization that does not just dwell on the problems. Of course, we do not uh, sweep the problems under the rug. We are very much aware of them. But is Jesus not alive? Is the Spirit not glowing? Even in the problems. 
is the water in the well of Sikar as polluted as the land and the people of Samaria in the wise of the Jews? No. In this refreshing water. started my, my, my conference, I asked them, why? Has God left the board room? <laughs> Is God absent in your board meetings? Why, why, why did you formulate the topic this way? I said, I was not the one. And then after that came an invitation from the Management Association of the Philippines. Another invitation came from the financial executives of the Philippines. Another invitation came from, please, I don't know, you, you might be able to help me, from the World Economic Forum in Davos, wow. Switzerland, asking me to attend next year. Huh? Is this still part of Mission Inter... Is that Samaria? Is that a well of sea car? Should I sit there? If I put my pocket down the ground, will I be able to draw dollars? <laughs> what do I draw there? <laughs> their ire, their anger, their wrath, what? <laughs> but I said, what's happening? What's happening? It's now these areas where the church has been very critical and uh, these areas of practical atheism, if you want to, to uh, call them that, you know, consumerism, uh, uh, profit, and uh, uh, co uh, materialism, all of this, now they're asking, can you sit with us? And can you show us how God could be present in our midst? Or is God already here? How do we, how do we hear Him? How do we... How do we uh, experience the presence of God? The world of the arts. 
the world of the agnostics. The new evangelization, according to the synod, invites us to pass through them and to stay. Now, but I want, before leaving this point, let us not think of the, the, the present Samaria, so-called hostile territories, only in terms of the contemporary world. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, in convening the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization, reminded us that the new evangelization is not just a perennial call to the church. It is not only uh, bringing the gospel of the reign of God to people who have not heard of it, al Gentiles, but it is also meant to be for Christians who have distanced themselves from the church. The new Samaria. And in fact, some people are saying it is easier to dialogue with people of other religions who are open than with baptized Catholics who have started closing themselves to the gospel. Mm -hmm. How do we sit with them? What are their wounds? What made them leave? What made them leave? So they might be the gentlest too that the church should immerse themselves Cannot be reversed. 
those who are below cannot. It is quite different from the story of Jesus' encounter with the woman in Samaria. Jesus was the first one to ask, and only later did he propose to give. And the woman who, at the first instance, was made aware that she could be a giver, in the end realized that she could be a receiver. The Synod of Bishops, reflecting on this story, challenges the church in the new evangelization to be not just a giver, but to be a listening church. And also, in the terminology of the message, to be welcoming communities. Receiving by being welcoming especially to the lost, the abandoned, the neglected. And by that welcome, they will realize they are rich. They have something to contribute to the world, to society, and the church. And the Synod calls the church to a self-examination with regard to this matter. Again, the triumphal church that thinks of itself as purely given. And we will not receive. And we will not beg. Way below our dignity. But here we're told part of the humility of Jesus is that he can beg without denying his capacity to give welcoming communities. And according to the sinner, in the new evangelization, where we have so many people, migrants, and even if they are already in their homeland, they are drifting, looking for meaning. You may be lost even in your own home. When I look at people in the shopping areas, moving here and there, <laughs> And you stop them, you ask them, why are you here? What will you buy in the mall? And many of them say, I don't know. <laughs> so they just walk aimlessly. They spend the whole day there, window shopping, but never stopping to buy. <laughs> so they come looking for something, and they go home not having found anything. But it is reflective not just of an economic or a business uh, uh, activity, it is reflective of something deeply human. I don't know with the, with the, with the youth in your countries, you know, the favorite word of some young people in the Philippines is the word whatever. What do you want to eat today? Whatever. What do you want to do? Whatever. What course are you going to take uh, after, after, uh, after high school? Whatever. <laughs> Who will you marry? Whoever. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, some sort of a, of a journey uh, where the direction, and you don't get angry with them. It's a, you, you have pathos towards them because you realize you also beg for meaning. Are all of us here sure of what we want in life? Now that I'm Archbishop, I notice that that is also the favorite word of bishops and sisters <laughs> and priests. Where do you want to be assigned? Wherever. <laughs> and you put them wherever, they say, why there? <laughs> You said wherever. <laughs> so the word wherever is not, it's not a, a, a signal of availability. It is a signal of not knowing where I really want to go. Now we are saying this not to despise anyone. We realize that we are in the same boat. 
And when you are lost, especially the midlifers who are here, you know, your 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 maps, your your usual maps giving you direction won't work anymore. So I tell priests or seminarians or priests especially who come to me, what will I do? You know, the old maps don't work. I prepare my homilies in the same way, but in the past, the, my homilies uh, clicked and they were appreciated. But now, I myself, I find my homilies boring. <laughs> I don't find joy in it. My, my, my strategies are not working anymore. I feel lost. I tell him, well, it has, a, it has a value. Now you can empathize with those who also feel lost. Then what, what, what will I do? Well, if you are lost, wait to be found. <laughs> you are lost, but trust that the shepherd will leave the 99 in search of you. Don't dare move. You will get lost all the more. If you don't know where to go, you'll get lost. Be still. You will be found. They don't buy that. <laughs> they don't. But some buy. Some take it. So I get SMS from priests that say, My shepherd, I am lost. Please find me. Please find me. <laughs> and I say, Whatever. <laughs> and journeys with the lost, with the youth, with the migrants, with the, with the refugees, with the poor, with the midlifers, <laughs> with Christians who have left the church. Can we be welcoming communities where they can find again a home, where they could feel that finally we have been found? We have been found by a family. Uh, just to highlight this uh, through a story. Uh, once I visited a parish, and I went around. Uh, I ended up in the uh, in the parish, uh, the office. Uh, so the secretary of the parish was talking with uh, a parishioner. And the, and the secretary was so uh, boisterous. She was shouting at the secretary, at the parishioner, who was simply asking the requirements for baptism. And the secretary said, look at you. You are a Catholic and you do not know the requirements for baptism. And the woman said, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I, I really do not remember. Said, that's the problem with you. You're nominal Catholics. And then she took out a piece of paper, showed it towards her, and said, Here, read. Read the requirements. And that's the time when I made my presence felt. I told the secretary, uh, 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 Why don't you take a break? <laughs> Coffee break, tea break. And I, will, I will deal with the, with the parishioner. And the secretary saw me said, oh, Bishop. <laughs> so welcoming. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I said, yeah, okay, go, go, go. And then I, I talked to the woman and explained to her. And then I, I met to the secretary and said, you know, who knows, when was the last time this woman had a baby baptized? Maybe four years ago? You don't expect everyone to remember these requirements. They don't come to church for baptism every week. <laughs> so, in the space of even if it's a yearly thing, you don't expect people to remember 
all the requirements. So understand. So you are the first face of the church. The people see whether it's a welcoming parish or not. <laughs> she said. But I'm just imitating the parish priest. <laughs> So, well, I had the chance to talk with the parish priest. I told him, you're very good. You have recreated your secretary in your image and likeness. <laughs> Welcoming communities. I have had my share of embarrassing stories about this. There was a, there was a, there was a, a woman who, uh, who kept going to my office to in invite me to her birthday, her 60th birthday. And I, I, I told the secretary, yes, I know the person, but I'm not too close to her. And besides, uh, I already have a number of appointments that day. But every day she follows up through a telephone call. Till one day I, I talked with her. I said, you know, I, I, I'm really busy, you know, that day. I offer my mass for you for your birthday. I said, but I want you to be there, she said. I said, you know, I'll be there in the spirit. <laughs> and she said, you know, uh, the reason is all the gifts, all the gifts for my birthday will be for your seminary. I said, oh, when, when is your birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly became welcoming. <laughs> but is it really welcome or is it self-interest and is it... <laughs> you are laughing. I know this, does, this has not happened to you. <laughs> but really, we are laughable. We are really laughable. It doesn't have, we don't need a new evangelization or a mission of emergentness to teach us this basic, basic things. No, but uh, I guess we really have to, to be reminded of, of these things. Okay. Let me go to the fourth point. <laughs> we want to finish the story. <laughs> now, so, so the two persons that both of them beggars, both of them givers. Now, Jesus tells the woman to call her husband, which she claims not to have. And Jesus tells her, yes, you're telling the truth, because this man that you're living with is your fifth man. So you really don't have a husband. So Jesus tells her the truth about her and her relationships. This leads her to suspect that this man must be a prophet or even the Messiah. And how does she describe the Messiah? The one who will announce all things to us. Then Jesus gives this discourse about worshiping not on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but the true worship of God happening in spirit and in truth. And he admits to the woman that he is the Messiah who will announce all things in spirit. Jesus speaks a word of truth. He, in a way, names the woman. And by so doing, by naming the truth about the woman, the woman is restored to her true self. And realizing that she is known for who she is, her eyes also are opened slowly to the truth about the person 
in front of him. Jesus listens to the truth, the unspoken truth about the woman. And he tells the truth plainly, without fanfare, without bravura, without condemnation, but with respect and even with love. The love that accompanies truth. And the woman recognizes him as the bearer of the truth. The new evangelization invites us to lead the world in speaking the truth. Truth about God. Truth about human beings. Truth about creation. Truth about evil. Truth about history. Truth. But of course, speaking the truth involves knowing whom we are talking with and knowing the world that they inhabit. Speaking the truth involves listening to the truth, especially the truth that is not always verbalized, truth that is suppressed. Like Jesus, the church is called to speak the truth of God in a manner that makes people see the truth about themselves. A God that makes or provides space for human beings to see who they are. This is a special way of speaking about God because in our contemporary world, as it was in the past, some people talk of God and in their way of talking to God, they eliminate or at least restrict human beings as though more of God means less of human beings. Others fall into the opposite trap. They want to talk about human beings, the world, and history, but they eliminate God. As though the truth of God and the truth of the world are mutually exclusive. But there is a way of talking about God we learn from Jesus the truth about God that makes God, makes God not the enemy of the truth of being human, but the God who gives space for people, even for a broken woman like this woman. Now, Misio Intergentis envisions peoples to work together for peace, for justice, human dignity, human rights, and the eradication of evil in the world. Now, one question that we pose is this. Can we presuppose that peoples of various cultures and religions have a common understanding of these values and aspirations? Do we have a common understanding of peace? Do we have a common understanding of justice? How do we reach the truth about these ideals that we are supposed to work on together? And how can the story of Jesus lead us to expressing the truth that gives space for different peoples to recognize the truth. But the fifth element of the story, the woman leaves her water jar, goes to the city, and invites the people to see Jesus, a man who has told her of all she has ever done, a man she wonders to be the Christ. Now, a few points. By leaving the water jar, remember his main, her main purpose for going there is to draw water, but now she leaves the water jar without water. She leaves it there, the well. Well, the woman shows that her deep, deep thirst has been satisfied. The thirst for truth, for compassion, for love. And also now she wonders about the person of Jesus. 
on the strength of her experience of a person of truth, she leads other people to her, to him. Now, according to the Synod, the new evangelization includes knowing the thirsts of people. What are people thirsting for? And how is the church addressing those thirsts? Maybe our programs are not uh, responding to their real thirsts. And another question, how does Misio Intergentis move from addressing the thirsts of people to an encounter with the person of Christ? Yes. The hidden presence and the work of the leaven that makes the dawn rise provides a key to the ortho orthodoxy of the universality of God's kingdom. Yet in the Bible, in the scriptures, there is also a call not to hide the lamp under a bushel basket and not to bury one's talents. So how do we blend the two? And, uh, can we get some inspiration from the story of, the, of this encounter, where an encounter with the truth, in a way, became the drive for the woman to see the person of Jesus. Not imposed on her, but coming as an inner insight you know, from her deepest thirst. And finally, many Samaritans believe in Jesus First, on the power of the woman's word. But after seeing Jesus, who agrees to stay for two days, they come to believe, for they themselves have heard him. Now, the new evangelization, according to the Synod, is not just about strategies, but also providing opportunities for people to encounter the living person of Jesus, who is the truth. While mission approaches are necessary, they are not the bearers of the truth that transforms people and society. It is rather the love emanating from the humble, simple man of God, Jesus, that effects transformation that effects transformation in a woman like this woman of Samaria. I know that Initio Intergentis does not exclusively <clears throat> dwell on the how, you know, mm -hmm. the how, but uh, and it is open to the, the why, the who, but in terms of emphasis, it says the emphasis is on the how, without denying the who and the why. My, my question in the context of the new evangelization is how will this how be determined? How do we determine the how? And how will the who and the, the why influence the how of Mission Intergentis? And how can we avoid a reductionism, reducing mission to mere pragmatism or functionalism <laughs> instead of a humanizing encounter that transforms people. I, 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 I raise those questions not because I know the answers, but uh, <laughs> maybe by, uh, by going back to the story of Jesus, we can uh, again, get some directions on not only new evangelization, but Misio Intergente as new evangelization. Thank you very much for your patience.